Welcome to the Hunter's Campfire. G'day, my name is Mark Vanden Bogart, hunter, fisherman, writer and storyteller. With me is Ian Hurley, technologist, hunter, hunting mentor and proud father. Together we want to help you get hunting. Our focus is helping you make the most of public land hunting right here in Australia, even if you don't live in a state where it's offered. This podcast series is all about helping you get started helping you build your knowledge and your confidence so you can get out there and live your own hunting adventures. Now, let's get started. Happy Friday afternoon, Mark. Happy Friday, uh, Black Friday afternoon to you too. Oh, it is Black Friday afternoon. We better keep this in date order if we're going to launch. <laughs> that's all right. That's good. We're going to put this podcast up today anyway, so that's um, that's no problem. And Black Friday's gone mad here. I have to say, I've I've jumped on the hunting Black Friday specials. It's, it's been really good this year. Yeah, I've just bought something just literally before we started. So yes, it yeah, it's not bad. Okay. All right. Well, we might talk about what that is in a minute because yeah. I'm I'm happy to share what just showed up in the mail ten minutes ago as well. So, um, look, this um this conversation really is a follow up from the previous uh, review of three items. Um, originally that was a discussion to talk about three items that we'd purchased that we thought were really good value, and um, have really influenced the way we hunt and and do things. Um, so if you haven't seen that, go back a couple of weeks in the podcast episode and you'll find that. Um, that episode to have a look at. During that, I suggested that we should have a look at a deep into our packs for a few items that um, ultimately never leave, which means you know we, we always take them with us, uh, and uh, we think that they're um, really important items to have with us. So um, some may be a little bit more important than others as we go through this, but um, each to their own, I guess, Mark. Well, I suppose employees, right? Importance is um, is relative, isn't it? At times, uh, you know. The meat processing processing gear is probably uh, you know not that important until that time you need it, then it becomes critical. So I think that's the the important of the importance of what's in your pack is really about the the time and place and how you want to use it. Very true. All right. Well, to get stuck into it, let's have a look at three items that you're going to pull out of your pack next time you go hunting, Mark. Okay. G'day guys, Mark from the Hunters Campfire Podcast. Now, if you caught our first three things podcast, you'll know that Ian put the question to me, what do I carry in my pack? Or what are three items that I've always got in my pack? So today, I'm out here missing red deer. (laughs) Not getting them, missing them. But anyway, I've got my pack with me. And what's in my pack? So before we begin, my pack is an outdoorsman's spur 50 which is an external frame meat haul pack so that's what i'm what, that's what's on my back and what's in it okay the three items that are in my pack that are always in my pack are firstly lens cleaners i always carry four lens cleaners with me i now wear glasses so Um, I'm always pulling the glasses out of my pocket, putting on my face and trying to, you know, for instance, see myself in a video camera after I finish filming this and all sorts of other applications because basically my eyesight's not so crash height anymore. So I'm always wearing glasses in the field, which means I need to keep cleaning them or they simply get too dirty. It's also very handy, of course, for binos and for the video cameras. So these are something that I always have with me. I have usually have four. I usually shove them in the pack and replace them when I get home. The second item that I always have in my pack, that lives in my pack, is my meat processing kit. Now, this is primarily an Allen's backcountry game bag pack so there's four game bags in here but there's also a packet of baby wipes which come in handy for all sorts of applications when you're out in the scrub Uh, two pairs of latex gloves and a knife sharpener 
keep the knife sharpener in here because when I'm processing an animal that's when I need the knife sharpener so it lives in this particular pack with me and this sits in the bottom of my pack and stays out I never take this out okay so the third item I will have to get that out for you uh -huh. this bit of old man luxury so what is this crazy thing I'll show you Basically a cushion. It's a cedar summit self-inflating cushion, which packs up very small and is very comfortable to sit on, especially when you're in rocky country and uh, you're doing a bit of glassing or you have a lunch. Currently, I'm sitting in some very comfortable grass, so I don't need it. But this always lives in my pack. And as I said, this is my luxury item. Uh, one thing about this particular model, this. Um, cushion is that it has a release valve and if you blow air into it to, to firm it up when you pop that valve it, it does make quite a noise so um, you just need to be careful about that because you, know, you can give the game away but other than that it's a very very handy cushion I sometimes use it for a pillow if I'm going to have a midday snooze out in the field but that's my um, three items that are always in my pack. Now that's not the only items that are always in my pack, but they're probably the three ones that you might not see every day. So over to you, Ian. All right, three good items, Mark. I've got a couple of questions for you though. I'm um, interested to understand, well, let's go with the glasses wipes first. Um, you obviously, you haven't always worn glasses. So is this a new addition to your pack or is it something that you've, you've thrown in recently? Look, I've worn glasses for a few years now, and um, I'm probably still not really uh, used to wearing them, especially out in the scrub. And the thing is, I wear glasses for, you know, for short vision. So it can be a bit tricky at times, you know, taking them off, taking them on, and invariably they get trashed. I, I generally buy a new pair of glasses every year because I break them, and two, <laughs> Between getting new ones and and breaking the existing pair, they get a bit knocked around and uh, invariably, you know, they're dirty. So I've got to be able to keep them clean, especially, you know, like if we, when we're using the camera gear or anything like that. And of course, also like when I'm doing, you know, finesse work, like I'm breaking down an animal, I generally got to wear glasses as well. So they get knocked around, they get really grubby and messy. So I find lens cleaners becomes really handy. I used to, uh, you know, carry a little soft cloth, but I just find that those disposable lens cleaners is, are great. And usually I can clean the glasses and give the binos a wipe as well and maybe give the camera lens a wipe as well or the scope wipe or something like that. So I usually get a bit out of them and just stuff them back in the pack, uh, it back in the in the pack and, and keep a few with me. In fact, I've got them right in right now. <laughs> All right, guys. So as um, a younger man, I carry a slightly different pack, but um, being an old bloke, I carry <laughs> lens wipes. No, look, I think if you're in if you're in the bush and you're doing well, if you're in the bush and you're hunting, you're going to have binoculars. I'm certainly guilty of looking through my binoculars and seeing nothing but fog, and then having to reach for a clean part of my shirt to be able to wipe them off with, and that's not good for your glass to start with. Um, I know if I peek down the scope. You know, you, you go past the, or well, you have a look at each end of it. There's grit and junk and stuff in there all the time if you don't look after it properly. And, and I'm certainly guilty of that. Um, I've seen uh, a, a number of people, they carry a little, it's a, it's a stubby little, um, it's like the tip of a pen that's got a soft end on it that they can yep. poke down there and clean things off. I've always um, thought about adding that to, I've thought about adding that to my kit, um, but the glasses wipes might do the job nicely. Easy to yep. find too, I imagine. Well, I've, I've 
because uh, with the camera gear, I've got those uh, various lens cleaners that are like a kind of like a retractable, retractable pencil, or the the ones that is it's rubber at one end and it's a soft cloth at the other end, um, which I have here at home, and I might throw in the kit with the with the optics when I go when I go away, but I find those little lens cleaners are just again they're lighter, and um, they're 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 easy. To, to use rather than take something that's you know that you might lose three or four of those in your in your your bino rig or a pocket something like that they're very very convenient excellent all right i'll go hunting for those let's move on to the game bag something that we've all got uh, in our pack um i think uh, most of us has got very similar stuff in there what what brand or um, where do you get the equipment the bags and bits and pieces that you put in your stuff bag so I used to actually have a game bag. So I had a, I think it, uh, I had a, a, a purpose-made game bag that used to sit um, as part of that kit. So because I used to carry a smaller pack. So if I got something, I'd almost have two packs. So like I have, you know, the one I'd wear on the front, wear on one, and one I'd wear on the back to carry out. Um, I with the new pack that I that I've most recently got, I've done away with the actual game bag as in the carry bag and just got the components now so i've got the various um well they're not calico they're actually silicon uh, not not silicon synthetic game bags which are uh, getting some good um reputation in that they're easier to clean and they do breathe a little bit better and they don't seem to um induce as much sweat on the meat which is pretty important those uh, they're allen's ones i got those uh, online uh, the other thing I ha keep in there, obviously, is things like um, you know gloves. Now they're not um, they're those particular gloves I'm using aren't the uh, the latex style. They're actually a little bit tougher. They they last a bit longer, and more importantly, they're not as difficult to get on when you're sweaty. <laughs> you know that that latex it tends to be the way. When you when you've got your blood pumping up, you've dropped an animal, isn't it? You got you got latex gloves and you got you know fingers sticking out and all sorts of stuff. They are actually latex. They're 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 not a rubber. They're a plasticized glove. But I find that they're a little bit easier to put on and they they're a little bit more robust. And of course they're, they're disposable as well. So I've got those in there. Um, knife sharpener. No matter how good. They tell you how you know a knife is. If you're breaking up an animal, you got to keep. You know, there's nothing wrong with stopping after a few cuts, giving the the blade a, a, a quick wipe over the um, ceramic um, steel, and then getting back into it and keeping that edge at, at you know at, at a good sharp uh, finish rather than blunting it and then trying to come back towards it. So, and I find that little um that little knife sharpener that I've got in there, I can't remember the brand for for the life of me. It's it is actually a pack design one. They make a whole range of uh, well, it's not stay sharp, but something like that. I can't remember right now. But it's got a uh, it's got the ceramic um, well, you know, it's not a ceramic steel, but it's the ceramic core, and it's also got a bit of a, um, a, a fine grit on the other side, and the two ends are angled, mm. so it allows you to get a an, a, a controlled angle on when you when you're sharpening. So if you do let it go a little bit too far, you can put it, put it on the grit. If you're uh, if you're keeping it your in in mind on it, you just keep using the ceramic, and it keeps it nice and sharp. And of course, I, I put that all together because that's when it's going to get used. For sure, that's and, it. And um, you got to say, there's nothing more dangerous than a blunt knife when you're butchering. Uh, yeah, and especially if you're butchering with someone and you're doing the animal together and they're holding the blunt knife and they're shoving away and you're standing there going, okay. Excellent. So, okay. Yeah, so that's it. What, what about um, – what about, do you carry anything else in your in your pack that would help you, you know, hoist that animal up in a tree or do you tend to do ground, ground – I, I um... tend to do ground work. Um, so there is a million ways of breaking down an animal. The way I do it is I, I, I use gravity. So unless I'm on a dead flat, which is very rare that I shoot an animal on a dead flat, um, uh, well, maybe the exception of 
uh, goats on on river on creek beds and maybe pigs, but most well, certainly deer are mostly shot on hill. Okay, sure. And, and yep. most of my goats have been shot on the hill. So what I tend to do is I tend to put the animal, if you will, perpendicular to the the hill, with guts facing downhill. And then I kind of work facing uphill, and I find that it the gravity works for me. So if I'm going to uh, break down a leg, I'll I'll basically put the leg under tension with gravity trying to pull the animal away from me. So when that when I cut that that I make those initial cuts, those cuts are under tension and they peel off very very quickly. Mm, for sure. um, same with back straps um, because I'm now working above the animal. There's the you know I've got um, the the skin moves away much easier, but the back straps in a really good position. So I can do, I can do both back straps at once, depending on obviously the terrain of the grass. But I can do both at once, and I can do them in in a very easy manner. Ripping off legs, you know, under gravity, uh, under tension is very very easy, especially um, front legs with that collarbone. So you can get the, you know, you can get the blade on the, the the blade of the knife under the blade of the shoulder comes off really easy and of course gutting them if you're thinking about taking the whole animal um, is real easy you know basically mm. it falls out and of course then you're dragging the animal downhill with belly up so keeping it clean so i tend to do ground um, ground gutting and breaking up an animal on the ground um, i have used at times you know try to make up gimbals and things like that but I, I generally don't do that unless unless there's a couple of guys and it's you know it's easy to do if i if there's two people working on an animal often hanging is a lot easier to work on together but i often hunt by myself so i just do it on the ground um i sometimes i used to carry some paracord with me i don't carry it as much but i'll probably carry it when when we go down the Pilliger, I'll throw it in there. But for when I'm up on the on the local block, I don't usually carry paracord because, to be honest, I can get if I really wanted to, I can get back to the car within a reasonable time. Mm. Yeah, that's sort of the way I'm dealing with it at the moment. And also, most of the game that I'm hunting, the most frequently is is reasonably small frames. You know, mm. it's fallow deer or it's goats or it's things like that. So uh, carrying that animal out whole is not usually too difficult. As mm. chasing a big buck, that could be. Um, that could be a bit more interesting, but um, I ha I've been through the process that you're talking about of carrying a gimbal, carrying paracord. I once hunted with a fellow who, who pulled a chain block and tackle out of his pack um, after we uh, shot an animal in the bush. So he'd been lugging that around the whole time, and I thought that that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but you go through these cycles, I think, when you become a new hunter, you want to get all the gear and you want to make sure that you're completely prepared and then you go through another cycle after that of minimizing everything and yeah. you know the little gimbal went out the you know the power cord goes out i'm the same i i use the gravity method and, and do most of it on the ground um, and deal with it that way and it, and it seems to work for me and that way you're not tiring yourself out carrying things on a on a hope that you're going to take an animal so anyway that's that's a good a, a, a good set of gear in the game bag i reckon yeah, so and as I said, it all stays together. So you know, and that's one of the you know, one of the challenges when you're working in the long grass and you you're starting to where is everything? Having that all together, just lay it out, bang, there it goes. And with the new pack, the way that the um, it, it's a meat haul pack, so it's got that ability for the bag to move away from the frame. Um, I don't need to figure out as much like how to carry the animal over my shoulder anymore. I can literally load it in the pack. Um, and it's away from me. Um, so, yeah, I, I've, I've done away from even like needing to have like a safari sling or something like that. I, I can basically have it loaded on my bag, on my, on my back, sorry, in the bag and in the frame space and have both hands free norm, as I would normally. Great. Okay. Let's go to item number three, the luxury item in Mark's pack. Mm. The cushion. Yeah, look, I, I, um, I started my outdoor career um, under the tutelage of a guy who is, to be quite honest, a tight ass. So he had a way of that, you know, there was no luxury items whatsoever with him. And so 
you know, so and that's kind of the, the school of thought that I started with. But to be honest, you know, I, I don't need to be uncomfortable anymore. You know, I used to almost I used to almost, uh, you know, revel in the fact that it was it was uncomfortable and hard, but don't need to do that anymore. So um, that little cushion is is great for like if you're glassing and you you back yourself up against a tree and you just you can just there it is and you, it's just comfortable um it's and uh, and to be honest a couple of times when i've been up on the block and i've gone up during the day rather than walk back to the car i've just basically found a bit of shade and had a snooze on the block and i've had a pillow with me mm. um the only thing is you got to get it right you know um you got to you got to get the inflation right um because uh, you know yeah, 85 kilo frame put a bit of pressure on it you know say so put too much air in it become you know when you sit on it, it gets too hard you've just got to play around with the, the the um the pressure and also depending on what you're sitting on um you know if you're sitting on rocks or something like that i also found that um i have used it once as a as a, as a rifle rest oh yeah yeah once i've used it i had the opportunity to use it as a rifle rest and the only reason i had the opportunity to use it as a rifle rest was i was sitting on it and behind a log and the opportunity came up i said oh hang on look out and of course so i basically put it on the log and had a rifle rest so it's a pretty handy little thing to have um i don't you could probably find other uses for it from a first aid point of view if you had to um but um for me it's just a pure luxury item it's uh and it's oh, it's probably the only luxury item that I carry in the um, in my in my pack. My gear is good gear, and I think that for me that's the luxury, the the quality of the gear. So that that that's a little bit of a, a, a you know. I remember when I first got it, my wife kind of went. She looked at me and kind of went. Yeah. Getting soft. Though. That's the kind of thing you you always making fun of people on, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, I was on. I've been on a, uh, one or two trips. Um, and we've been way up in in sort of high country on rocky turf, and uh, one of the one of the guys in the crews pulled out you know a nice soft pad, um, normally um, uh, sort of like an an eggshell, not a foam pad, but a you know similar sort of thing, but more like the old um, uh, bivy roll, you know the the, the thin exactly. foam pad, and, and people fold them up and put them on it. And I can tell you, it makes all the difference. I did have a giggle when uh, I was watching a video. And you pulled that out, but uh, I, I have to confess that um, old mate that that had one of those on a on a trip recently. Um, by the end of the trip, he cut it in half and given me a side uh, because we were sitting on fairly uncomfortable on um, rocks and and hard stuff for, for long periods of time. And half the battle when you're hunting is is patience and being still and being quiet. And if you can increase those odds, then you know why not. The other time that I that I, I didn't have it with me and we actually had to find something else, was in the cold. Um, this year when we were hunting uh, down in um, below Tamworth, and one particular morning it was quite cold. And it was actually really, really, really useful to have a map just to sit on the ground. Because, I mean, it was, you know, it was, we were sitting on basically frost. So it was actually acted as a quite a good insulator. So, um, and I didn't have that one with me. We we literally just grabbed some stuff and took it with us. But I'm glad we did because it was cold. So, and I, so I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be you know perched on a rock in in New Zealand looking for tar, sitting on a rock that's you know that's basically three quarter ice. You'd want something underneath you then. Oh, for sure. Yep. Sorry, I thought I was on mute a second ago telling my dog to go and sit down. <laughs> She's running around trying to pull cables out of the camera, which is not ideal. Um, all right, well, that's, that's three good things. Um, thanks for sharing those. Let's um, go and have a look at the three that I've pulled out of my pack and we'll, we'll um, have a bit more of a conversation about those. Sure, looking forward to it. All right, thanks, Mark. Three things from me. Firstly, here's the pack. Oh. It's a Hunter's Element boundary pack. It's been through some tough times. It's stood up to most of the tests. It's been overseas with me. It's done a number of seasons with me and it's it's done a really good job. Um, it's big enough to carry out uh, most of a broken down uh, animal, uh, mainly fallow, short, the reds and salmon and things like that are a bit big. 
um, but certainly uh, has all of the features you would expect in a pack and enough components or um, things on the pack for you to uh, allow yourself to accessorize. So it's a good pack if you're looking for a day pack. Um, there's a number of uh, people that I hunt with that are using the same one. And, uh, seems to be doing a good job for us. In that pack, three things that always come with me. Two of them, uh, they're all necessary. And we'll just get to that. The first item, talking about what Mark was talking about, and that is the game processing bag. Blaze orange, so that it can go on the outside of my pack and just give me some extra visibility. It's a mesh. Uh, bag so that it can breathe. It's really designed this thing here to put a cape in, strap it on the outside of your pack. But I also carry the processing gear in here. So in here, I would normally have some mutton cloth or some, some cheesecloth uh, just to, to go around a carcass if I'm hanging it, keep the flies off it. I also go down to the local butcher and get a number of uh, meat bags. So they sell a ham bag. Um, they're a nice big bag that can go in there and uh, quite easily drop um, the hind quarter of a fallow or a red in there. It's big enough to wrap around that and drop it in your pack and, uh, and carry it out. So um, that's what's in there. I also butcher with rubber, rubber gloves, not so much to keep my hands clean, but more to keep the meat clean. If I'm working inside the gut cavity, um, once I'm finished with that, I can whip those gloves off, put another pair on, and then I can deal with the meat without contaminating everything. I think that's a really important thing. Um, but the other thing that I have in here that, uh, that Mark didn't, uh, and that is, I have a carry strap. So I've made this carry strap, it's just a piece of webbing, goes over my shoulders, uh, and it just gives me a comfortable way to carry out a couple of hindquarters. Uh, the, the carabiners here go through the, the back tendons on the legs, and then they can hang around my shoulders, and I can carry out quite comfortably. Uh, or I can just put it through those tendons and use it as a drag strap. So I can drag it through the, through the bush by myself. It can just go around my waist, and I can just power through with my legs and drag an animal out that way. Um, I find these really handy um, just to give yourself another level of comfort if you've got to take an animal out over long distance or longer distance. So that's that piece. The second one, and I seem to be the guy that always goes on about safety stuff, uh, first aid kit. So in my bag, I have a standard first aid kit. It has all of the things that you would need to deal with a cut, a graze, a sting, a bug bite, a splinter, a poke in the eye or something in the eye that you need to flush out. Um, it's got you know bandages and stick, all of those things that you, you would need. But I also carry this one, which is a snake bite kit. It's got a couple of compression bandages in it, um, as well as a snake identifier. It's just a little chart, tells you what the snakes are that probably have bitten you. Um, and it has two of these compression bandages. Point to note is you can now buy a snake compression bandage that has a little uh, picture on the side of it, which is a rectangle. If you stretch it out tight enough, it'll turn into a square. It's a really good indicator when you're putting a bandage on a snake bite as to how tight that needs to be. When that turns into a, a perfect square, it's the right um, tautness, tightness. You know, you know what I mean. Anyway, I'll upgrade these to that um, sometime in the short term. Anything that this can't deal with, like I've said before, the EPIRB is your go-to. You need to push that button if you're immobilized and you can't get out. You don't want people worrying about you. You don't want to be exposed to the elements. Don't be a hero, push the button, get out of there alive and uh, don't succumb to the elements. Last essential item that's in my pack. When you're glassing deer, looking for deer, you've just taken an animal, you're sitting down, you're having a relax. Something's happened, you've pushed the EPIRB, you're waiting for the helicopter to come. It's only one thing to do really coffee it's important for me anyway um, so in here I've tried all sorts of different coffees um, I used to carry a little um, a little uh, boiler pot um, too heavy I turfed that out I got one of those cacao plungers um, so that you can just put a, a pod in there and it can make a shot of coffee um, I quite like that um, just drop the pod out of my brew kit to there um, Worked okay, again, probably a bit big for what I wanted. And then these guys, two years ago here, came to market with a really good quality drip filter coffee. Um, you've all heard of it. I don't need to tell you about it, but I have I rate it. It's good. Um, and that is nice and small and light. And really, you can get two coffees out of that. So if you're with a buddy, you can just boil up once and, and use the same drip filter for two. But I think um, that's, uh, that's something that's in my pack always. 
stocked up and I just love a good coffee when I'm in the bush on a cold day. Three things, plenty more in my pack that I can talk about, but for now they're three things that I don't tend to go without. So um, yeah, there we have it. Back to you, Mark. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's have a chat about those three things. So first thing is your, um, your meat processing gear. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, look, it's not too dissimilar to yours, Mark. It's got uh, much the same things, except I do use those uh, latex gloves. Um, I just find that I like to, to strip them off and replace them. Once I've finished in the gut cavity, I like to then chuck those out and then get a fresh set just to keep the meat clean. Um, but, you know, that's just personal preference. I've, I, I agree with you. They're sometimes hard to get on when, you know, you've got sweaty hands and things like that. But, you know, I, I deal with that and that's the way it goes. Probably the only thing that I've got in mind that would be different to yours was that um, carry strap. Um, I've always looked for something, you know, often you'll find a stick and you'll just, you know, put two back legs over the back of your shoulders. And if you're doing that for any length of time, that's not the most comfortable and trying to get the balance is never good. So um, I, uh, I, just, I just built that strap with a couple of carabiners on it and made it the right length. And it's been perfect. And, you know, you can throw a couple of legs in the back of your pack. I don't carry a big pack. I noticed that your pack um, was, a, was a meat hauler. Um, I don't have the meat hauler pack. I've, I, I tend to be able to carry most of it out either as a whole carcass or, um, you know, two, two legs or even three legs into the pack that I've got. Uh, and I deal with it when I get back to camp. Um, but that's been really good. Uh, if there's, you know, a bigger animal on the ground and it's just you, then yeah, it can go around my waist and I can just power through it and get the thing back to where I need it to go. Um, or like I said, just hanging the, the hocks around your, around your neck works really well. So that's probably the only addition that I've added there. Yeah, the, the drag idea is, is um, something you don't see much here in Australia, but overseas it's incredibly common. In fact, in, you know, like, places like scotland that is the norm you drag it and they you know they've so they've got all these variations of like a you know basically like a, a dog collar a, a dog lead for humans type things where you know they've got full harnesses that ones goes around your waist and so you're basically dragging the animal so it certainly um as i said it's something you don't see too many people do here but it makes a lot of sense um i remember the you know the couple of challenging carry outs when you're doing being taken out whole reds and you're doing it you know it might be three it might be a three you know three trip run type thing there's times you having a drag would be a hell of a lot easier um that's for sure and even getting it in a position to start with can be you know can be tough at times um so yeah it, it's certainly an interesting approach and i like how you've got it so you know it, it you can kind of balance it and it hangs down below you there like that. Mm. Yeah, so it's either over my shoulders, carrying it like that, or it's just over my pack and behind me. Yeah. You know, pack to hold it, but you lose a lot more balance doing it that way and you've got less control of it. But I've had I've had to do that once or twice. Mm. So, yeah, with the pack too, I, and I, was, I had a quick look at your pack on, on there. As well, I for, for a long time had a smaller day pack and I used to carry, as I said, a secondary meat bag in it. I've gone for the larger pack and one of the reasons I, I went for that is not because, um, you know, more animal, is that I've actually found it's hard for me to find a smaller day pack that actually fits my body. Mm. I, they're always too short, and, you know, and they just, it's annoying that it, it's hard to, and the reason I went for that particular one was that frame is a full size frame with the smaller bag on it. So it's only like a an overnight bag. There is a bigger bag you can get it, but it's a, the actual the frame is what's what's um what's the most important part. And you can actually it's it's not infinitely adjustable, but you, I could adjust it. So I finally finally felt that it fit me properly. Mm. Look, I'm one of these guys who's got too much stuff. Um, you know, I started with a big pack because I thought, no, I'll just get the big pack. I'll put everything in the base of it for my day trip and I'll cinch it all up nice and small, but then I can carry all the meat. And that seemed to be the right answer. But that bigger pack was also, you know, it, it has its own weight. You know, mm. it's difficult to get a, a quality hunting pack that, you know, is, is light because they do have a bigger frame for meat hauling. Then you can move to a hiking pack, but they don't quite have, you know, they're, they're all slightly different technically. 
Um, I moved to the pack that I showed earlier, the Hunter's Element Boundary Pack. Um, I'm also finding that that's too big for a day trip. Um, it gets all my stuff in it, but unfortunately it gets all my stuff in it. Uh, and that means that I'm hauling around too much gear. Now, I'm hauling more gear than necessary because I'm, you know, potentially got a drone in there, my, my camera equipment and bipods and extra batteries because I'm trying to video and film things um, as much as I am shoot. But that that's probably the only reason I've got the pack of that size compared to something smaller. Here I am pondering the Pilliger, Mark. We've booked the Pilliger for early next year. I'm super excited about going. I'm so pumped to go because it's going to be the first trip over the border in quite some time. But I know it's going to be hot and I know it's going to be, you know, we've got to be very careful about how much gear you have on your back. So I also have a much smaller Badlands pack, which is really a bladder pack with a little bit of stuff underneath. So I'm going to be able to get three litres of water on my back a first aid kit, not a lot of other things that are going to go in there. So I'm, 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 I'm sort of stuck. I'm still trying to figure out the best carry option uh, for me, but at the moment, that's that's where I'm at. Yeah, I, I, I think there's almost another discussion in that pack design because certainly for 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 a number of years when I've hunted the Pilliger, I've been using a, just a Camelback Mule, which is you know the three liter with a very small pack with a couple of pockets on it type thing. Mm. So it's certainly worth worth considering. Oh, that's quite interesting. So your next item was uh, well, actually, I kind of thought the strap was really, you know, almost like a, a secondary item. So it's quite interesting. And of course, then you've got your first aid kit. Now I've got a first aid kit, but I, it wasn't one of the things I talked about. But again, specifically with yours, the snake bite component, which was um, uh, the snake bite kit, which is quite interesting. Yeah, you know, uh, being the New Zealander that comes to Australia that notices that everything in this country wants to kill you, I thought I would try very hard to, you know, um, stay alive. Um, I never had a snake bite kit in my in my bag until fairly recently, and that was just a combination of five or six hunts tripping over snakes. On every hunt, there was another one, there was another one, there was another one. And then um, I was out with a mate on a day trip, and um, fairly sure he got tagged by a snake. And and I say that because by the time I had him at the hospital, he was basically unconscious. We don't know what happened. Um, they weren't able to tell us. They, they knew it was some sort of poison. They didn't know if it was potentially a reaction to um, some of the nasty plants that are out there or whether it was a spider. It's more likely to have been a snake. We were just lucky that we were on uh, we, the, the block was closest to town, so it was sort of a 25 minute drive out of town. Um, we had finished our hunt. He was actually opening the gates on the way out for me to drive through when he started to feel a bit strange. And um, he just went downhill real fast. Um, he just wanted to go home and then all of a sudden it was no mate you're going straight to ER this is this is serious and he had an overnighter there and it was quite concerning for a time so it made me think more about getting stuff for uh, for the localized conditions and, and obviously here in Australia um, the snake bite kit's important um, I also have the dog with me whether I'm going to figure out where to put a snake bandage on a dog I, I really don't know but maybe if the if the day comes I'll, I'll figure that out but uh, I did talk about the bandages that you can now get i don't know if you've seen them mark have you the they've um it's a white bandage and when it's not compressed it has a red rectangle on it and when you stretch it it turns into a square which tells you that you've got the right compression mm. now the thing that really interests me about that is you've got a it's a fair amount of effort just with your two hands to pull that to the right compression strength which tells me that the majority of us probably don't know how tight to put on a compression bandage over a snake bite. So that will enter my 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 kit sometime very shortly, uh, especially before we go out to the Pilliga. Uh, maybe there's a Black Friday special coming up that I can capitalise on. Sure there is. I'm sure there is. Yeah, I, 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 I'm quite interested in that, 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 um, that indicator in a bandage because, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, uh, that whole question of how much pressure and, and in your mind is, are you actually doing damage by putting too much pressure and stuff like that? It's quite interesting. So I actually want to investigate that. I I, I get my first aid gear through a, for a through a particular company that a friend works for, and they're always sending me emails. So next time they do, I'm going to reach out and see if they've got these particular ones because that does sound like a very very 
good thing to have and to be honest it's just another bandage anyway so you know you can certainly use it for other things and um, you can replace what you've got with that one and have yeah. it multi-purpose yeah, yeah it just I makes sense a, to me a really quite interesting idea and i always and i'll still say it and i'll say it every time we bring up first aid and things like that is um don't be scared to use your repurp it should be an item that we talk about as part of these reviews um i know everyone that's hunting with me down there was one, only one person left that hadn't bought an epurp who messaged me the other day and said i've got one now yeah um you know thanks for pushing me to do it. it it's just one of those things you should have for all sorts of reasons but um first aid kit should sort out like i said sprains bumps scratches a poke in the eye those sorts of things but if you're immobilized just you know don't don't risk too much uh you want to get out so anyway enough on that yeah, look, I think that's a really important point. Um, I've got a, you know, a personal locator beacon, a little tiny thing, absolutely no, you know, it's you know, hardly bigger than a, you know, an old matchbox car. Not a problem to you uh, to carry at all. And um, you know, there you go. It's just it's right there. So you've got that. So if things like phone signal and that stuff, that's a, a little bit annoying at times. But what you've got there is something that's not relying on that. That that'll actually get someone to find you um you know they might find you too late but at least they're going to find you uh, i think that's a that's a really good point and i noticed that in a number of hunting uh, videos on youtube you see the guys they just have them on their packs just got mm. one there just and then as you said absolutely weighs nothing very convenient and there you've got it whereas that third item oh there's no, no way you can describe that as convenient <laughs> where it is. Okay. I, 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 just, I was stunned when I saw that, to be honest. <laughs> and what yes, we, well. Even was even more confusing, or not confusing, but, you know, to me was that, that you'd actually gone through a whole process of different items and different processes so you could find, you know, the best coffee. Yes, the best coffee. And look, there are plenty of people out there that enjoy a good cup of coffee. Um, there's more to this backstory than just me being a coffee snob. Um, yes, I enjoy a good coffee. I wake up in the morning and have a coffee. Before I go hunting, I'll have a coffee. I enjoy it. There's, there's no doubt about it. And if there's a luxury that I can have on the hill, that's got to be the one. It'll, it beats chocolate for me any day of the week. So that's my thing. But the backstory behind that is uh, in my early days uh, in life, I left school and I joined the military. And, um, you know, I was in New Zealand, uh, you know, one particular exercise when we were in, in training, um, we were digging big holes, it was sleeting, it was raining, people were getting hypothermia and getting flown out. Like it was just a nasty, cold, wet scenario. And the pick me up was that, um, unbeknownst to us, our captain, even though we were digging his foxhole, the captain had the billy on and he came around with a big pot of hot coffee. And even the boys that didn't drink coffee wanted a nice hot cup of coffee because it was a morale boost. And I've never forgot it. The same thing was with cigarettes. Captain didn't smoke, right? But he came around three or four days after we'd been in the sodden rain with a carton of smokes to hand out to those that were smokers that all of their rollies and papers have been completely saturated and they were starting to get miserable because of it. So for me, it's a morale boost. I don't always hunt by myself, and certainly when we go into um, some of the high country places and some of the more challenging uh, hunting locations overseas, you're with a buddy. And if you can be that guy that brings out a bit of morale boost, you know, when you're at your lowest point, when it's cold and you're tired and those sorts of things, then, I, then, then that's my thing. So it always reminds me of that. Now, sure. I'll, I'd like to um, I like I'd like to pull out the old man butt pad and uh, and sit down on that and uh, and brew a coffee while I'm glassing. Um, last light. I don't mind having a a coffee in a little thermos and and sipping away on that as the sun's going down and you're watching things. Um, it's great. And yes, I've reviewed a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I've gone from coffee pots to wakako plungers to all sorts of different things and. Uh, thank God for dog and gun coffee. They brought out a good drip filter system and um, plenty of us like it. It's now as small as a tea bag, so why not have it in your pack, I reckon? There you go. Look, I, I, I'm a coffee snob, but I, um, I, as my wife will tell you, I actually sometimes uh, enjoy being disappointed by, poor, you know, <laughs> going, well, as they call it, a cup of disappointment. And uh, so I, I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd take so much as a carry it with me, but 
I mean, look, I, I have carried, I, I have carried um, a little, mostly it was like two minute noodles, to be honest. So uh, yeah, um, yeah, I was, I was, I, I liked how it was a little kit even, and he you know, put a kit on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put a brew kit sticker on it just to remind That's me it. what it is. It's at the top it. of my pants, ready to go. All right. Well, we won't we won't go too much further into that. Before we do go, there is one item that I picked up in Black Friday sales oh, okay. that I'm that I'm now going to look at, and that is this guy. It's a bee free. Um, it's a catted and bee free water purifier. Um, so it's a really fast flowing um, water purifier. Doesn't take away germs. It only like it basically it filters out all the junk and the the, yeah. the the horrible nasties that are in the water before you boil it. It's a really simple little solution with a filter in there. Um, if I walked over there and got the the uh, the instruction manual, I'd be able to tell you what the microns were. So that's it's, basically it's taking out the, the material in it. So it's like the sticks and the grit and the dirt. Yep. Any any real and nasties that comes out is boiling out as clear water. Yep. And then you're still boiling it to kill any bacteria or something in you know? it. Or dropping in a um, a um, a tablet, a purification tablet. If you okay. to. The good thing about this is unlike the pumps that you see, the pumps are really heavy. They do the same job. It's the same micron filter as some of those water pumps that you see. Um, this is a squeeze bottle. So you fill it up and you squeeze it through here and it forces the water out really quickly. So you can fill up, um, you, know, a, a, you know, a 250 mil cup in about five seconds that whole that thing there is uh what is it 600 mil i could squeeze that all the way through the filter in about not even 10 seconds okay. and so which is really good some of the other filters take a long time you would have seen the old drip filter method where you get a um almost an old hessian bag uh, and and you can put some stones and bits and things in the bottom of it and you can filter through that still into a cup to boil but um that is so small and light and easy it's going to replace one of the other items that I've got in my pack. So, so yeah, I've got the older MSR pump that you know pumps basically is a is the dual one. It's a filtration as well as a um, as a uh, it has a, you know so it has a has an ability to take out some of the the nasties in it, and it actually was designed to screw into one. Of, is it the Narjing big bottles? Yep, the Narjing. Uh, yep. Designed to design to do that. So I've got, I still got a few of those. Um, they're getting on, but I still got a couple of, uh, three of them. And that's so that it was designed for that. But that's actually, that's not a bad idea. Not bad for sixty bucks. That's not a bad idea. I think that's one worth worth waving the flag on because, yeah, you can it you can screw that up and you know, as we were talking to uh, in you know, uh, we'll come out later podcast Brian Boyle up there and. The Northern Territory. That's not a bad thing to have in your pack. Hmm, I think so. Hmm. Anyway, um, that's it from me. Hopefully, that gives everyone another couple of things to ponder and, and see if they're of value to them. And uh, we'll uh, have a look at doing a few more shortly. I reckon so. Good to speak to you again, mate. Okay, good on you. See ya.